Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to channel number two. If you stumbled upon this video by accident and you're new here and you don't know who I am, I am known more by Hannah the Horrible, which is my main channel. This is Hannah the Horrible's sister channel dedicated to only listener subscriber scary stories. This is more like a podcast. You can watch if you want. There's going to be the story on the screen for you to read along if you'd like. However, if you want to just listen like a podcast, I think it works great like that for a lot of people. A lot of people telling me that they're like doing their art while they're listening to me, like drawing and stuff. And I just, I'm so flattered that you guys are like using me as like calming noise or whatever. I don't know if it's calming considering the stories, but still. I just love that. So the instructions for submitting your own story is always in the description box. And yeah, let's get right into it. Here's story number one. Hi, Hannah or Miss The Horrible, if you'd prefer. Hannah's fine, but thank you. You're so sweet. I'm not sure how exactly to share this because I've never actually told anyone this story outside of a group of kids on the playground when I was in the fourth or fifth grade, but I'll just get right into it to save you some time. In the early 2000s, my uncle volunteered yearly at a local haunted house event in his hometown. Very standard Halloween stuff. They decorate it, get costumes, and make fake blood and slime, etc. But the cool thing, the relevant thing, is that that this was actually an old fashioned mansion built sometime in the mid to late 1800s. That sounds so cool. I want to go to a haunted attraction in a mansion from the 1800s. Wow. So jealous. It added a naturally spooky air to the artificial decorations. Plus, it was spacious, so the house could be as big or small as the team wanted, depending on the effort they had the time to put in that year. Of course, since I've mentioned it was a very old house and in the rural south, at that, you likely see where this is going. The first story my uncle mentioned was the classic candle in the window type, a potential ghost of one of the wives of a former head of the house waiting for the return of her husband that would never come. The guys would see her pretty regularly when they drove away from the house after a day of setup. Sometimes they'd even claim to see her peeking out the window in broad daylight. The one that scared me the most was a room that no man could enter. One of the guys went in there with his girlfriend and she turned to see him starting to cough until he turned blue. Once they got out, he said he'd felt like something was choking him. Nobody had a clue what that was all about. But the longest and most interesting story that he had told me involved what he thought to be the ghost of a little girl. It's been over a decade since he told me, but I remember each of the details to a T. They named her Emily based on one of the confirmed daughters of a former resident of the house at least 100 years ago. She died around the age of eight, so it made at least a little sense to these guys trying their hardest to wrap their heads around these bizarre events that this must have been her ghost, still trying to goof around and play all this time later. She usually kept to small stuff. One of the actresses for the house, the one who did the intro before guests would enter, wore a giant ragged cloak, and Emily loved to tug on it just to get her to fall back a little, making the guests think it was time to enter. Each time she'd pull the cloak back and, without her blocking the door, people assumed it was okay to start walking in. The ghost had a very clear sense of childish but harmless humor. It was kind of cute. If I ever get haunted, that is the type of ghost that I want. Somebody, probably a child that is funny and plays pranks on me, but is not mean. The team got accustomed to her. If paintbrushes wound up on the other side of the floor, they'd just playfully roll their eyes and continue like nothing had happened. When tiny plastic spiders or eyeballs went missing, they'd shrug it off. Glad Emily seemed to enjoy her new toys. They even found out over time if you rolled a ball, usually a dodgeball to the center of any room and waited, she'd roll it back to you. And of course, every once in a while, a guest would compliment the creepy little girl laughing sound they'd heard in the haunted house. 
Really, she seemed to like this group, and I guess she enjoyed watching the haunted house come together each year. There was only ever one time where she behaved a little strangely. That year, the group wanted to try to make the house even bigger, and that meant utilizing all the floor this time. My uncle and his friend Mark had been tasked with measuring some of the rooms to see what would and wouldn't be feasibly big enough to fit a small crowd and some props. This was fairly early into the season's preparations, so it was just the two of them at the time. And I feel like it's important to mention nobody was really off put by the place. They knew it not to tempt fate or anything, but aside from that one aforementioned room, the mansion itself was not unwelcoming. They routed electricity into it and had running water in the kitchen so nobody had to go home for dinner or anything. Nobody felt threatened by the house as a whole, but in hindsight, maybe it is still a little telling that this was a completely sturdy, safe building, and yet two grown men didn't want to venture there alone, even just for 20 minutes. My uncle set the measuring tape on one end of the room and Mark began to drag it to the other, but quickly realized there was something stuck in the divot between the floor and the wall. He bent down, probably letting go and snapping the tape on my uncle's fingers in the process and slid a finger in the small gutter, finding a few marbles that had been stuck there for God knows how long. The two of them were a little amused by it and a quick glance to one of the other corners revealed a few more covered in dust neglected for decades. Nobody really messed around up here, so right off the bat, the two came to the definitely perfectly logical conclusion that it was their little ghost friend Emily messing with some keepsakes from her life. Mark pocketed two of them to show the other guys later and then simply moved the marbles out of the way, haphazardly shoving them into the hallway to finish measuring. Once they were done, the men went down to the base floor where the team had stashed some pizza in the fridge they'd set up and had some lunch. Mark finished first and told my uncle he was going to look up there again to see if the room parallel to the one that they just measured across the hall was a mere copy of the first so they wouldn't waste any time repeating themselves. My uncle shrugged, nodded, and started to finish his crust as Mark went back up the stairs. There was the sound of of a few heavy thunks on the solid oak stairs as Mark ascended, a split second pause, and then hasty footsteps coming back down. Mark wasn't horrified, and he wasn't even as shaken up as I would have been in his shoes, but he still knew that if he didn't immediately tell my uncle, there was no way that he would believe him. Mark quickly told him, you have to come see this, and probably expecting some kind of cat scare of a prank, my uncle went up behind him. In the room they just left, there was a ring of about 40 marbles doubling up in some spots back to back to create a neat little circle in the center of the room. The marbles in the hallway were here and then some as if they had just multiplied by themselves. The two looked at each other for a minute, hesitant and not sure what exactly to make of this. Mark reached into his pocket, set down the marbles exactly where he stood in the doorway and then announced to the ghost, okay, Emily, I won't mess with your marbles anymore. After that, the two agreed to cut their losses and leave for the night. The apology must have worked because after that, Emily was back to her giggly, playful self. Nobody else had an unusually cold experience with her after that, but more importantly, nobody ever saw any marbles on the property from that point on. I don't think Emily had sinister intentions with either of them. I mean, if their theories were correct, she was just a little kid. But still, the way their view of her shifted, just for a second, to the point they were unsure of what to do about something as deceptively simple as a circle of marbles on the floor. It must have been chilling in the moment. It's no wonder the experience stayed with my uncle for years, even after they'd stopped transforming the mansion for the Halloween season. So naturally, my uncle just had to tell his eight-year-old niece in the middle of the night while staying at a cabin in the middle of nowhere. And yes, he got a real talking to from the family about scaring the kids after that. That's an uncle's job though, right? I hope this was as interesting to you as it was to me when I was little. I get that it might not be the most drains the color from your face, leaves you shaking and questioning your morale, your mortality type of story. But if it's also stayed with me for this long, it must mean something. Thank you for reading Cherry. Cherry left a PS too, just a message 
to me. I didn't want to bulk up the body of the email with this kind of stuff, but thank you for providing me with hours of videos and stories to listen to while I draw. See, that's what I'm saying. I also appreciate how respectful you are when discussing cases involving real victims. It's nice to see someone who understands there are real human people behind these tragedies and their families are still out there hearing what we say about them. Thank you so much, Cherry. Those are super kind words. The reason I'm reading in this, reading them in this video is because I just don't have time to respond to every single email that I get. And so if I'm reading your story anyway for a video, I'm just going to respond here and say thank you so much for the kind words. I do feel like, I mean, being respectful to victims is, in my opinion, the bare minimum. So I don't really think I'm doing anything special by doing that. And I think everybody should be doing that. But still, I do appreciate the sentiment as well. As for your story, I do have one nitpick and that is, <laughs> it's not a nitpick. I'm just saying, um, since you did not experience this firsthand, if you're open to logical explanations, is it possible that Mark, your uncle's friend, was messing with all of you? He goes upstairs by himself and then nobody else was there, is it possible that he thought it would be funny to play the marble prank, to bring a bunch of marbles one day, hide them in his pocket and go upstairs and mess with everybody because he knew this lore of this little girl ghost in the house. Is it possible that some of the other tricks for him as well? I'm not saying the house is not haunted. I'm just saying it would be pretty funny. And it wouldn't surprise me if like your uncle's friend was just messing with them and just stuck with the joke this entire time. However, if I, when I go to a haunted attraction, if that attraction was actually supposedly haunted and they added actors and stuff to it, that would be prime time experience. Cause you wouldn't know if what you were experiencing was all part of the show or if some weird things that happened during your haunt, like what if, what if it was a ghost, you know? Okay, moving right along. This is story two. This starts, hi, my name is V and I occasionally watch your videos. At the time of writing this, I've gone through some life changes and found myself watching your channel again for comfort. Thank you for providing that and I hope you get some chills from this story, regardless if you're a believer in demons and ghosts or not. I still get them to this day describing it to others because of how surreal it really is. It's a bit of a long story. Brace yourself. Trigger warning for animal death as well. Thank you so much for the trigger warning, everybody. There's an animal death in this story, FYI. I'd like to start this off with me being a dumb 22-year-old at the time was really into paranormal and seeking out things from the other side. More is the Ouija board stuff. The biological side of my family is also a family of witches and delve into paranormal things as well. So it is where I get it from, the fixation. So that's what I and someone I am no longer in contact with, my friend at the time, had done, purchased a board out of boredom while house sitting one night. It went on as one does the triangular piece you use to move the to move the planchette, I think they mean, on the board did move a few times. However, I did not believe it to have been on its own doing. I thought it was my friend doing it. We'll call him A. We laughed it off, getting bored pretty quickly, deciding to use candles to see if something or someone or anything really was in the house with us. We just looked this method up on Google, lol. Well, we spoke to the candle and it sometimes would burn brighter depending on the question being yes or no. After a while, we once again got bored and put it away, blew out the candle, left it on the counter. Well, A and I did not put the Ouija board away out of forgetfulness and rushing to go lay down because it was pretty late at that point. That was a very big mistake on our part. The next morning, we woke up to the candle and a chair knocked over in the kitchen and all the wax had fallen out. No animals were at the house during this time. It was only me and A. Freaked out by this, we packed the board up and returned it to the store later that day. Fast forward a couple of months at this point, A has been informing me with his 
other house sitting visits that the lights out and upstairs doors would open while he was there. It was a pretty big house. He only stayed in the living room. One night he was so freaked out by it that he had me come stay with him. He hasn't gotten to the house yet. And on my arrival, the lights were off. But once he got there and we had walked in, the lights had come on and I was getting really scared at that point. That night, luckily, nothing really happened aside from that. Another couple of months pass. The owners of that home had seen something in their doorway. The husband had jumped at it, assuming it was an intruder, and after that, it quickly went downhill. He started going crazy, not being himself, to the point that he had to move out and the pair had separated. They owned two dogs who were raised together. Oh my God. Okay, I'm reading ahead. Big trigger warning. This is sad. Never aggressive or anything. And one of the dogs bit the little dog's head off. Now at that point, A and I really believe we had released a damn demon into that house. So we tried taking it upon ourselves to get rid of it somehow. Dumb, right? I mean, not really dumb. If you really thought that that was something going on, why wouldn't you try anything to make it go away? I mean, I think that's what I would do would be like if I really thought something paranormal was happening, you know, sage the place, call a priest, etc. Goodness. Okay. A few weeks since these incidents, A wants me to come over. Apparently it growled at one point, which I didn't believe. It had also knocked a painting down off the catwalk, which sits above the living room couch where he and I usually sit. I show up, the door upstairs opens. It's next to a kid's game room, kind of like a closet. The way it looks in itself is creepy enough, so that factor only adds to it. A and I were walking casually talking about it because we read that if you show fear, it only makes things worse. Well, have I got something for you, Hannah? We were on the topic of it growling. I asked, do you think it'll do it again? I want to hear it because I feel like you're lying. And I kid you not, halfway down the stairs, you can very vividly hear what sounds like a dog growling at you for about two seconds. But no animals were in the house, only A and I. I started to get very scared, like crapping myself scared. We did not venture into any room without each other, even if we had to use the bathroom or shower. We were just too scared to be alone. About an hour later, telling someone else about it, we look up how to get rid of a demon, which recommends reading specific Bible verses. An even worse idea, we are not licensed exorcists. Is there any licensed exorcists? I don't think there's a license for exorcism. I think it's just being a priest if is my understanding. But this just pissed the thing off more. Once I started reading, we were in a corner, no room for anything to get behind us. It started tapping slash knocking and making noise right behind us. After that, I never went back. I am no longer in contact with A or anyone associated with that house. It's been about five and a half years since that, so I have no idea what came of those instances. I hope you enjoyed this story. I always get shaky telling it to others. Maybe this will be a fun story to share during Halloween. Thanks for reading. What the heck happened after that, though? I guess if you didn't go back, it was fine, but... Dear Lord, that's really terrifying. The dogs is what got me the most. Obviously, I'm sure that's what got most people the most. But I mean, like, yeah, dogs do sometimes hurt other dogs, especially small or weaker dogs. But like to kill it so violently is whew, that's terrifying. OK, we're going to go right into story three. Hi, Hannah. Your channel is really cool. Your content is creepy and your voice is very comforting. It's a great combination. I have a spooky story that I think would be very appropriate for Halloween. It's not exactly terrifying, but it's a bit creepy and paranormal. Thank you so much. Too long didn't read. I accidentally cursed my college theater company and no one knows that it was me. (laughs) I love stories like this. That's so funny. I mean, what are you going to do? Like tell them like, yep, that was me and have everybody be mad at you? Hell no. My name is Phoenix. Many years ago, I was a theater kid at a small college in rural Pennsylvania, and during this particular semester, a number of things were happening at once. I was in an acting class with the delightfully eccentric old professor who ran the English major's drama track and was the staff advisor for the theater company. I was in a Shakespeare class with the same professor, and I was in the play our theater company was doing at the time. I think the play itself is the best place to start. It was a piece I don't hear 
vinegar mentioned much. Vinegar Tom by Cheryl, I think is how it's pronounced, Churchill. It's got some postmodern vibes, lots of meta asides, etc. But mainly it's about witchcraft in the 17th century England. And it had a creepy vibe. And we were leaning into it with how we marketed the production around campus and in the community. At the same time, we were studying the tragedies in my Shakespeare class and with Macbeth at the top of mind for the professor, he mentioned the Macbeth curse in our acting class. You probably already know this, but it's considered extremely bad luck to say the name of that play in a theater unless you're actually working on the production of the play itself. If you do, it's supposed to put a curse on the current production. No, I didn't know that. I was never a theater kid. That's a fun factoid. That is, as far as factoids go, that is the funnest of factoids. Thank you for sharing that. Interesting. Now I kind of see where this is going. Our professor, though, being an old duck and full of interesting knowledge, told us a lesser known part of the legend, that there exists a counter curse. The person who cursed the production must be forced outside through the nearest exit. Once outside, they must spin around three times and spit on the ground. They must then beg to be allowed back in the theater. Once they return, the curse should be lifted. Normally, this would have been a fun bit of lore that I likely would have forgotten over the years, but I never ever forgot it. Not after what happened. See, I was in the green room during the last week of rehearsals for Vinegar Tom. My friend Andrew and I were working on some homework for the Shakespeare class, and I was talking about the essay my then girlfriend was working on for it. I mentioned that it was about Macbeth and then quickly stopped talking. Andrew, who didn't believe in the curse, smirked at me, but he was the only one who heard me say it. I shrugged it off at the time. No harm, no foul. That was until the harm actually started. Vinegar Tom is not a musical, but there are a few songs. Most of them were sung by one of the lead actresses in the show, an absolutely incredible alto who had played the witch in Into the Woods and Mama Morton in Chicago during her time at school. She was an amazing performer, and our production was lucky to have her. Her understudy was also a very talented actress, but a bit more shy. We only really cast understudies as a formality, though. There was no way she'd actually have to sing. Phoenix, what did you do? Oh my gosh, I am already like, oh, okay. Except that our amazing singer got laryngitis on opening night. And by the time the show was to start, her voice was completely gone. (laughs) Phoenix. (laughs) Still, the show must go on and the understudy for the role did a phenomenal job. Oh, that's good to hear. Okay. No one thought anything of it. We all told our friend to get well soon and moved on. We had a few technical problems here and there throughout the night, but nothing major. Not until a few minutes after the end of the show, when someone broke into the control room where our sound guy had his laptop, which contained all of our backing tracks and the images for the projections in the show. Everyone started joking about a curse, and that's when my heart dropped into my stomach. Once most of the others were gone, I pulled Andrew aside and asked, if he remembered our conversation from the other day. He didn't at first, but I reminded him that I'd mentioned the name of the Scottish play. As I said, he didn't believe in the curse, but things were getting desperate, and some of the cast and crew, with a more morbid senses of humor, were predicting serious injuries or death for the coming days. Andrew forced me through the green room doors and into the parking lot where I spun around three times and spat. I apologized and I begged and I begged for him to let me back in and he did. By the next day, our singer was on the mend and the laptop had been recovered by campus security. No one other than Andrew and I will ever know that I was the one who put the curse on the production. Unless you choose to read this and any of the former cast and crew watch your channel, I guess. If so, hi guys, go down. Dutchman, hope the last decades treated you well. Sorry about the laryngitis, Jenna. (laughs) That was Phoenix. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm laughing because nobody actually got hurt. But I just, I'm so sorry. I think it's so cute that Phoenix is like, well, I guess I'm telling you guys now. 
<laughs> oh, don't go put curses on things. Even if you're skeptical, it's never a good idea. Even though I know in this case, it was a total accident. Like it just slipped out. Does it count if it just slips out? That feels unfair. It feels like if it was just part of a conversation, it was an accident. Like, yeah, if you go into a theater and you're like, Macbeth, that's a little more fair. But that seems unfair that y'all got cursed and you didn't even mean to. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's move on to our fourth story. Hi, Hannah. My name is Ellie, and I have a story from several years back. Every year on or around Halloween, my family chooses something scary to do that night. One year, we visited an old abandoned house. One year, we ran through a graveyard, etc. It's nice to get together since we don't really see each other a lot. Some of my cousins live out of state, and it always ends up being really fun. We live near a park that's known to be pretty weird. Pretty much everyone in that town has a wild story, and anyone who visits after dark will tell you that it gets really eerie. I played there a lot as a kid, but my parents always took us home before sunset and they were really careful about keeping us in sight whenever we were on the playground. My dad grew up in and around town so he's pretty well versed in the stories and such. Anyway, my mom and sister both have experienced stuff there, so they suggested we should run through the park that year. We all agreed. I was maybe 12 at the time, although I could have been younger. My cousin, let's call her Annie, was the same age, a few weeks older than me. We were excited. It was the first year we were allowed to come. We were packed in the car with several other cousins, my older brother, her older sister, oh, Annie, I think Annie's older sister, and our parents. We took turns trying to scare each other with the campfire stories we've heard before. Annie and I were pretty thoroughly spooked even before we arrived at the park. Couldn't be me. You're brave. When I was 12, I was a total scaredy cat. Could not even watch Disney Channel scary movies. They scared me. Eventually, we pulled up. You couldn't see anything. It was pitch black outside the car, not even a streetlight lit. The trees were tall, imposing figures draped in black. The silence was eerie. We all sat in the car for a few minutes, wondering if we even wanted to get out. After a while, my older brother said something like, we might as well, and opened his door. Annie and I followed. We crept toward the dark of the park, Annie and I clinging to each other in terror. There was no wind. I remember that clearly. The only sound was the crunching of leaves underfoot and our shaky breathing as we moved forward. The silence was broken by a choked whisper from my aunt. Oh my God, what was that? There was movement deeper in. We tried to see what it was. Just a deer, my uncle assured us. You can even see its antlers. Look. But we couldn't. No matter how hard we looked, how much we strained our eyes, the shadowy silhouette didn't look much like a deer. And then it stood up. My older brother took off running. Annie and I stood shock still, watching my brother disappear into the darkness towards this thing, taller than a deer, standing on two legs, shrouded in something like black silk. It looked at us. I maintain to this day that it looked at us and then it stepped behind a tree and disappeared. Your brother ran towards it? I'm sorry, what? My brother came back wide-eyed and at a loss. He hadn't been able to get close. It disappeared before he could see it clearly. My mom grabbed his arm. Let's go back, she said. Annie and I agreed, but my brother and a few of our cousins wanted to stay longer and see what they could find. My mom relented. Georgia, one of our eldest cousins, offered to take me and Annie back to the cars. My mom and my aunt Rachel came with us. As we were walking, we saw something at the entrance of the park where our car was a figure next to a tree taller than any of us there wearing a black cloak just standing looking watching us it left when we got close but annie and i began to sob this was more than we had bargained for and georgia aunt rachel and mom got us back in the car without any trouble we were holding on to each other as tight as we could they're dead annie wailed and i remember the cold weight of dread in my stomach we'd left them hadn't we with those grotesque terrifying creatures our family was still out there mom and aunt rachel tried to calm her down but annie wouldn't be soothed she, i was just sitting there in horror. I couldn't think, couldn't breathe, just sat there and stared ahead. 
It took several minutes before we saw anything else, and this time it was a light. The beam bounced off trees, illuminating the car and the entrance to the park. It cast everything into deeper shadow, but we could see their faces. My brother, Annie's sister, Uncle JJ and dad and Aunt Callie and our cousins racing across the grass and the dead leaves getting closer and closer. We yelled at them from within the car, stupid encouragements that wouldn't have mattered all that much, except there behind them in the trees, a shrouded face peeking out from behind a tree. (gasps) Oh, it's coming. Annie screamed, digging her fingers, nails into my arm. Hurry faster, go faster. I was still in shock. I hadn't even opened my mouth. That's probably why I saw the other one. It looked just like the first creature, cloaked, shadowed, slinking through the trees, dead set on our family. It trailed its hands along each branch, not exactly hurrying, but not moving slowly. My tongue felt like lead. My heart dropped. I could feel the blood drain from my face. They weren't going to make it. Somehow they did. Both creatures watched as our family tumbled into the car as Aunt Rachel rolled up the windows and locked the doors as we drove away. I turned around in my seat as we left. There they stood at the entrance of the park just watching. That's all they seemed to do. Watch. We've talked it over in our family over and over. Most of our family says it's probably just people in cloaks messing with us. I'm sort of inclined to agree, but my brother swears they didn't move like humans, and my cousin says she could just feel that something was off, and my uncle refuses to even talk about it. So I don't know. I've been to that park here and again in the years since, but never late at night and never alone. Thank you for reading, Hannah, and for any insight you can give. Listen, I do actually agree with you and some people in your family that said you think it's just people messing with you in cloaks. Now, The reason I think that is because it's Halloween, because you guys always do something on Halloween. And you said that this is on Halloween night when you guys got to go, right? To go spook yourselves out. And it would just make more sense that people would be dressing up in cloaks to go and spook some random people at a supposedly haunted park. I don't think that makes it any less scary, though. In fact, I think that's even more terrifying than a paranormal answer, in my opinion, because those are real people that who knows what's under those cloaks, who knows what their intentions are, who just sulks around a park scaring people for the enjoyment of it. Like, yeah, I mean, it's just a Halloween spooky season thing, but still, like, They must find some joy in making people feel unsafe. The other weird part about that explanation, too, is that probably there's not a lot of people at the park on Halloween night. It's probably trick-or-treaters are mostly at, you know, trick-or-treating. People are at parties or in bars and stuff like that. There's not a bunch of people at the park. So it would be a lot of effort to go dress up in costumes and go to a park where maybe you'll see one family or something like that. That's the only problem I have with that. Other than that, I have no idea. If paranormal stuff is real and this is paranormal, it sounds like a cryptid to me. It sounds like some sort of pack of something that are like, go away. This is our, this is where we live. That was a fantastic story. I am thoroughly chilled. Okay. Whew. All right, let's move on. Here is story five for today. This next story goes Halloween stories. Oh, bestie, I have got a crazy one for you. Firstly, my user on YouTube is yo, pronounced yo like yo, yo, angel. Gotta flex that the Hannah read my story, you know? You you guys are so funny. Okay, so my grandparents are part of a weird Christian church that's honestly kind of a mega church. They have lots of locations in the southern east coast area of the U.S., and me and my sister used to travel with them often to church events known as feast meetings. Because of how much we traveled, we have no clue what state this story takes place in, but 
Anyways, their church is a really strict one. Can't wear jewelry, even wedding rings, no makeup, hair dye, alcohol, tattoos. You get the point. So obviously, Halloween was a big no-no. Our Halloweens at my grandparents' house were just gatherings with our church folk. Nothing special or festive. This one particular Halloween was going to be at someone's house. Do I remember whose house it was? Not in the slightest, but I do remember what it looked like. You know the house in the intro of the older Scooby-Doo, the one that bats fly out of? Yeah, that, in the middle of nowhere. It even had a wrought iron fence with a gate around it, like the thing was just begging for something creepy to happen. My grandparents dropped me, female, and under the age of 11, and my sister, a few years older than me, at this person's house. It was a middle-aged couple who probably had kids, but I don't remember. It was already dark by the time we got there, and this was back in the early 2000s. When I say get together, I truly mean just to get together. There was no candy, no meal, no movies, literally just talking to people. This church does not sound like any fun whatsoever. It sounds like they hate fun. Naturally, there were kids there and naturally we wanted to play. Their backyard wasn't very big, but they had a decent amount cleared off without any trees. There was a brick patio thing that had a freestanding hammock and I actually fell off at some point in the night. A pre-built shed from like Lowe's, you know the ones, and a rope swing tied to a tree on the edge of the forest that bordered their house. I found out later that there was a treehouse in the forest, but I never ended up actually seeing it thanks to what happened. What I'm about to tell you honestly sounds made up and bonkers, but I swear to God it happened and actually messed me up for a while afterwards. So us kids were bored. We played hide and seek in the dark house for a while, but that wasn't fun enough. We decided to take it outside. At this point, it was probably like close to midnight, honestly. Thankfully, we were in the South, so it wasn't cold in the slightest. Some kid leans up against the back of the house, counting with his face covered and the rest of us, a good 15 kids, book it in all directions, trying to find a place to hide. I, being the genius I was, decided that the shed was the perfect place to hide. It was a normal shed, like I said, one of those pre-built ones, and it had a proper door with a lock on it and a window. I went inside and hid behind some tools and waited. But there was an odd noise in the distance. At first, I thought I might have accidentally turned something on, or maybe it was the buzzing of the light that was off. My dad also has a shed, and it was pretty normal for his to do this, so I wrote it off, staying crouched in my hiding spot. But it kept getting closer and louder, and finally, I could tell what it was. I shit you not, it was a chainsaw. So imagine me, right? Tiny little me hiding in the middle of nowhere on Halloween night with a bunch of strange Christians and separated from my sister hearing this chainsaw in the distance getting closer and closer to me. Of course, I immediately think it's a prank. Now, my grandparents' church, as I said, was strict, but pranks were extremely common among the younger members. In fact, it was well known that if you were caught outside late at night at the main church's campgrounds, you were getting attacked with water guns and balloons. So I don't move. Why would I? It's just a prank, right? Plus, if it was a chainsaw, you'd probably want to stay hidden. Dude, I wish this grown white man comes up to the door, chainsaw in hand, and starts trying to cut the door open. Evidently, he saw me sneak into the shed and decided it was the easiest target. He can't see me, but I can see him. He had a blank expression on his face. He wasn't smiling. He didn't look angry or determined. Like, it was just completely blank like he was staring off into space. He was wearing a denim jacket with some worn t-shirt underneath. Couldn't see the rest of him due to the size of the window. He had dirty blonde hair that was down to his shoulders and a short beard. I would have shit my pants. I don't know if you've ever been that close to a chainsaw that's actively cutting something, but that shit's loud. I've only been near chainsaws in like haunted when clowns 
chase after you with them in haunted woods, haunted attractions, but they don't have chains on them. So not nearly as terrifying as this, but I know how loud they are. I can understand that. We were in the middle of nowhere, so it was pretty quiet other than the occasional animal noise. And this dude was going to town on this door and I was just waiting for him to realize I hadn't locked it. Locking it felt like cheating because the game required you to be physically touched before you were considered found. So I left it unlocked. I'm sitting there staring at this man cutting the door down at the hinges, shaking so badly I'm surprised I didn't fall, and I start to hear the loudest yelling I've ever heard. I couldn't make out anything over the chainsaw, but the dude jerked his head to the left, took one look at whoever was yelling, and ran off back into the woods with his chainsaw. It was the house owner, the husband. Looking back, he was absolutely insane for confronting him like that, but I don't want to think about what could have happened to me if he didn't. He had some trouble trying to open the door with all of the damage to it, but he ended up just straight up kicking it in to get me once he realized I was literally having a mental breakdown in there. His wife took me inside and had me sit down in the kitchen while she called my grandparents and had someone find my sister who was still hiding in the treehouse. I mentioned earlier, I asked her point blank if it was a prank that went just went too far. Her husband was back inside and responded before she had a chance, and he said yes. I think they just wanted to comfort me at that moment because I could tell he was lying. He was definitely lying. Why would so the, you would not destroy somebody's property as part of a prank? That's not a prank. That's a crime. So that was not a prank. His wife chimed in saying that she doubted there was any teeth on the chainsaw and that I was never really in any danger. No teeth. No, ma'am. Your door is quite literally in two pieces now. But yeah, there were no teeth in it. My grandparents came to get us and we rode wherever we were going in silence. I ended up falling asleep at some point, probably from the terror making me exhausted. Yeah, an adrenaline dump like that would make you so tired. I don't really remember anything after that, but I have a bad memory, so that's to be expected. No, we never called the police. It wasn't even discussed. I think they knew the police wouldn't have taken that call seriously. I mean, it was literally Halloween and it sounded so obviously fake. I never told my parents what happened and I just kind of moved on. I had nightmares about it for years though, oh, I'm sure. Never wanting to hear a chainsaw again after that. Now I'm mostly okay with them as long as it's not too close. Obviously the guy was never caught. We have no idea what he was planning and honestly, I never want to know. Anyways, I tried to be entertaining throughout this story as it's a short one. Love your channel and your TikTok series. Hope you're having a good holiday. Thank you. Thank you so much for your story. What the hell? Okay, I'm not judging you guys at all for not calling the police. Like, I'm sure you had, I'm sure, especially your parents, it wouldn't have been your fault. Like, your parents would have had to call police and, or your grandparents, excuse me. And like, they probably didn't feel like it was worth it or something. Or like you said, that they wouldn't believe you. I'm so stressed out. I'm sorry. That is so messed up. I don't know what he was planning either, but that is, like I said, that is not a prank. That's just a crime. I can't believe he was never caught. I, I'm sorry. I'm like legitimately speechless. I don't have any other thoughts. I hope you had some sort of therapy since then to be able to talk through this because that is like legitimately real trauma, especially for a child. But me as a grown woman, if that had happened to me, I would be in therapy. I would be having PTSD and bad dreams, like you said, for years. So I can't, I just can't imagine. I just feel so sorry for, I mean, not only you, but your child version of you that went through something so unbelievably terrifying. And like, if you think you're going to die, like you have a moment where you're sure you're going to die. Like there is nothing more terrifying. Oh my God. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's so terrible. Okay. This is going to be our last story for today. Hi, Hannah. I'm super excited to send this and hope you get to read it. First off, this is from my parents and not me, but still, I've heard both stories so often that I know them by heart. Also, you can just call me Kian. Kian? Kian? Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong for this, so I know it's mine. Okay, so this first one is from my mom and dad when they still lived with my Nana, my mom's mom. My mom gave birth to me when she was around 20 years old and fresh out of community college. Her and my dad lived with her parents up until they had my brother, so around two years after I was born. So I think 
An important thing to mention is that my family lived in a super tiny junction town in Texas when this happened, and almost nothing out of the ordinary happens there, even now. Anyways, when I was around a year old and learning to walk, my parents had gone to sleep in one of the bedrooms and put me in another one across the hall. During the middle of the night, they both woke up and heard what sounded like a young child running and laughing in the hallway. Mind you, I was the only minor in the house, and my parents thought it was me, so they got up and checked the hall no one was there, not even an animal or something. They checked my room and I was fast asleep in my crib, still covered in my blankets and pillows. My parents obviously freaked out, told my Nana about this, and she had a medium or whatever they're called out to the house. And without saying a word about the event, the lady said that there were two spirits or entities on that property, an older and more aggressive male and a young female child around four, I believe. This freaked my parents out more, and as more events like this happened, although rarely, they saved up and finally moved away, and now we live in the next town over. My nana got rid of the house and had it sold off, but before she sold it, she would take me, around 13 now, to the house, and the doors would be unlocked, or lights on, or even figures in the window that we couldn't find when we went inside. Honestly, everyone is glad that the house is gone and we don't have to deal with it anymore. Scared me so much going there when I was younger. Yeah, I bet. Okay, second story. This one is from my dad and isn't supernatural. This also takes place in the early 90s when he was a kid living in the Bay Area of Texas. This also has to do with the Texas killing fields. So one night on Halloween, my dad doesn't remember the exact year he was trick-or-treating with a group of friends and his mom was the chaperone. She was a middle-aged, red-brown-haired lady and was very attractive from what my dad's friends say. I wonder what it's like to have a hot mom like that like to have a full-on milf as a mom I wonder if that sucks sometimes anyways the way they did this was all the kids would walk up to a door and ask for candy while my grandmother stayed on the sidewalk and watched while they were doing this though a white van pulled up and two guys opened the back and tried to pull her in Before they could succeed, though, someone in the group saw this and got everyone else to follow him and attacked the men and free my grandma. Now, this group of kids were maybe 10 years old, and there was about eight of them, these all being kids that would act up and get into fights and break up dog fighting in the streets. So they had some grit. All of them started just throwing hits and punches, trying to pry off the men. Eventually, they succeeded and the men drove off. My dad is very adamant that if he he hadn't saved his mom, she'd have been killed or something and become another victim of the Texas killing fields. It's scary to think that if they were a second late, I might not have my grandma anymore. Anyway, that's both of my stories. I hope you like them. Have a great day. I'd love to see this in a video. Okay, I have to look up what the Texas killing fields are because yeah, I know I'm a true crime person. I have never heard of it. So the wiki says... The Texas Killing Fields is a title used to roughly denote the area surrounding the Interstate Highway 45 corridor southeast of Houston, where since the early 70s, more than 30 bodies have been found, and specifically to a 25-acre patch of land in League City, Texas, where four women were found between 83 and 91. The bodies along the corridor were mainly of girls or young women. Furthermore, many additional young girls have disappeared from this area who are still missing. Most of the victims were aged between 12 and 25. Some shared similar physical features, such as similar hairstyles. However, despite efforts by the League City, Texas police, along with assistance from the FBI, very few of these murders have been solved. And those that have been solved were predicated on confessions given by prisoners or confessions given under duress from the police. The area has been described as a perfect place for killing somebody and getting away with it. After visiting some of the sites of recovered bodies in League City, Ami Conan Mann, director of the film Texas Killing Fields, commented, you could actually see the refineries that are in the south end of League City, you could see I-45, but if you yelled, no one would necessarily hear you. And if you ran, there wouldn't necessarily be anywhere to go. A task force composed of local law enforcement officials and FBI agents called Operation Halt, Homicide Abduction Liaison Team, has been formed to investigate the incidents. 
main channel video idea, but what the fuck? Okay, so it seems, my understanding, it seems like it's not necessarily a serial killer killing all that all these cases are connected. It seems to be more that that area is the perfect place to kill somebody and you're more likely to get away with it. So people seem to choose that area. That definitely sounds like what this was too. It sounds like if you were in that area and they were trying to abduct her, that's so terrifying. I'm so glad that she's okay. I uh, Just a good PSA too. We're going to wrap it up here, but just a good PSA too for this Halloween. If you guys are going out on Halloween, remember, we talked about this in the last Halloween video, but remember that criminals on Halloween might take advantage of the fact that people are in costumes. Remember, people might put masks on and pretend like they're, you know, just walking around in masks. It's more socially acceptable to hide your identity over Halloween. And like, I'm not saying don't have fun. I'm going to go have fun on Halloween. Go do what you were going to do. I'm just saying be aware. Just always like make sure you know where all the exits are and just like kind of be a little bit more aware of your surroundings. That's all I'm saying. So, okay, that's going to be it because all those stories were super duper long. So we're going to call it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave me a comment. Leave me a like on the video to help support the channel and help the second channel grow. And I will see you all in the next one. Okay, bye.